Hey, Ken Rollo with FreshAndAlive.com coming back at you from the big metropolis of New Smyrna Beach, Florida. And today I have my friend Charles Bodie with me who I met a few months ago uh, on my adventure with mold and mildew in my home and ozonation to get rid of it. Um, and in that exploration, uh, I came across, actually, I think a mutual friend introduced us, but I came across Charles and was really um, impressed with his ozone technology, which seems to be, from everything I can find uh, out on the market, it seems to be the absolute top, uh, most powerful ozonation equipment and service for getting rid of mold and mildew non-toxically in buildings. And also, the great thing is it's far less money than what I've spent in the past on this kind of treatment. And so I got really excited and uh, snagged myself a couple of his machines so that I can ozone, ozonate my own house for a lot less money than hiring somebody to do it. And so I wanted to get him on camera here talking about this stuff uh, because he's, this is just one little tiny thing that Charles does. Uh, he's one of the few people I've met who has been into a lot of the same stuff that I've been into, a lot of very advanced technologies, free energy, all kinds of stuff. And so, you know, I recognize him as a kindred spirit, but also somebody who is a cut above with technical knowledge. And so he's the kind of person like me who looks for the absolute best technologies and whatever it is that he's doing and finds them and brings them to market. And so we're going to talk about several of them today, but we want to start out with Charles. First of all, welcome. Thanks, Ken. And uh, we want to talk first about ozonation of homes and buildings for getting rid of mold and mildew, and then we'll spin off into the other applications for it. Well, sure. So tell me a little bit about how you got into this. Yeah, well, uh, Ken, I'm uh, notorious for a couple of the books that I've written, and one of them is called Got Mold, Now What? A Basic Guide to Understanding and Correcting Mold in Your Home. And I didn't want to write that book. Unfortunately, I've just met really thousands of people over the years that have been suffering from real mold problems and the health associated health issues that come along with it. So 20 years ago, I was a basement waterproofer from the Cleveland, Ohio area, and I, I heard about mold remediation, and I spe started uh, being called in to do waterproofing for the first local mold remediator in the Cleveland marketplace, and I kept finding mold on the jobs that he'd done. So I, I confronted him with it, and he, he didn't care, and uh, so I got certified. I hung my shingle. I started to do mold remediation, and, and something funny happened. Uh, in my first six months, I had three ladies that developed a reaction to the chemicals that I was using. And they were EPA approved and biodegradable and, you know, supposedly safe stuff. And I shared with you a little bit before about how that started a whole personal journey for me and how I found out about organic foods and natural products for healthcare and a bunch of things, all through trying to find a, a, a natural way to remediate toxic molds. And at first I thought the ladies were totally crazy. You know, mm -hmm. they were claiming a reaction to my chemicals and I was the proud mold remediator and I had lab tests to confirm it was safe and their husbands were not having a similar reaction and the job sites were all beautiful and so I rolled up my sleeves to, to prove them wrong and along the way I got an education and found out that I was the one that was wrong and needed to, to change. Mm. And um, so I did one of my favorite things which is I got on the phone with some uh, professors and I started calling mycology departments around the country and talking to these professors to find out. And mycology being? It's the science the study of mildew and, mildew and mushrooms. And fungus, yeah. Yeah, thanks, I'm sorry. For those of you that don't know, thank you so much, Ken. <laughs> and yeah, mycology is this, you know, area of science that is very underappreciated, let's just say, and mycology professors are sort of lonely guys and no one cares about what they study, so I, would hit them up during their office hours and, and they'd ex express a passion for their field of research and they taught me some really vital things that I know you believe in and I've used for years, which is, you know, our, our, I developed the country's, what's been called the country's first all natural mold removal protocol and it's based on hydrogen peroxide, um, borax, although a special kind of borax uh, that, that gets dissolved better so it'll penetrate and, and then ozone gas, or O3. 
And uh, we didn't develop the system overnight. It, it evolved over the course of a couple of years. But um, I have treated mold professionally in over 42 states. And, and now I've created an all natural do it yourself mold removal system for, for folks that can't really afford um, to hire a mold professional. And, and sadly, even worse, what I've discovered, some of the things you've uh, come acqu uh, become acquainted with is that most mold professionals are not very professional right. and really don't understand the science behind the why of what they do. Exactly. So they're typically some contractor types with a background in you know, construction or demolition or mm -hmm. something, but they really don't understand the microbiology microbio behind the why of what they're doing. Exactly, and it doesn't take much to get licensing to be a, a mold remediation uh, I think there's only eight eight or nine states, maybe 10 now, that require yeah. licensing for and it. And here in Florida, I don't think it requires licensing, but there is some, some kind of test state offers that you can take that gives you some kind of certification so you can say you've got that certification. But there's no, in, in Florida, there's no licensing required to do this. So any Tom, Dick, or Harry can come in off the street and start doing mold and mildew remediation. Well, you know, I don't, I'm not up with all the state's laws, but uh, it certainly is the case that across the country, you know, most mold remediators have some certification or another, but they're mostly not licensed. And, and I don't really care about the license or the certifications, because what I discovered is that the companies that teach and certify mold people or mold professionals will pussyfoot all around the subject of mold remediation like dancing around the mulberry bush, but they don't actually teach with specificity how to do it. Which products to use to kill the spores, which products to use to kill the root structures, which products to use to break down the secondary metabolites and contaminants that come as a, the associated result of mold, like the mycotoxins, the MVOCs, and, and even you know the dead mold, the PC parts, the beta-glucan right. proteins. Right. Yeah. Exactly, because I've used um, um, effective microorganisms to get rid of mold and mildew in my air conditioner, and I was absolutely amazed that the microbes eat the mold and mildew so that it's completely gone. There's no residue left. It's an awesome thing to do at the end of a mold remediation. Once you've killed the active infestation and you've broken down the secondary metabolites, eating up those dead proteins is a very important part of eliminating the allergenic response. Because mm -hmm. they've done a lot of studies that show that the beta-glucan proteins that form the mold particles are actually responsible for creating an allergenic response in humans. So the effective microorganisms essentially gobble it up. Exactly, that's it. I mean, I was amazed. I had an air conditioner, brand new, it was only a few months old, spent a fortune on it. And this was when I did my first remediation we ripped out all the air conditioning, all the ducts, uh, you know, all the carpets, replaced everything, repainted the house and all that. And within three, four months, the inside of the air conditioner, the new one was full of mold. Now the old one wasn't, which was interesting. And it's because the new air conditioner had all these chemicals in it, you know, paints and coatings and things that mold and mildew likes to eat. Yeah. And so I, you know, opened up my air conditioner to change a filter and it's full of mold in the insulation. I was like, oh my God, what am I gonna do? And so I sprayed it down with the EM, came back two weeks later, gone. I mean, gone. One of the only things you can do here in Florida, and, and I'm a recent uh, convert to the state of Florida, so uh, I've had the opportunity over the last nine months that we've been down here to, to look into the supply boots and the return boots of many HVAC systems. And I've almost not found any that are without mold, uh, to use a double negative with intention. Yeah. I mean, they're literally mold in every one that I've seen. But it's not like up north, you know, uh, up for your northern viewers, they have hard metal ducts, and you can actually call up a real duct cleaner. They can send rotary brushes and scrub the ducts out and clean them. Mm -hmm. But in Florida and down across the majority of the south, it's flex duct mm -hmm. and fiber board made out of fiberglass. Exactly. And those that fiber board is a bio nesting area extravaganza where, <laughs> you know, 
little tiny pieces of pollen and dander and dead skin cells and dust mite and the, the feces from dust mites and the fungus that grows on dust mite feces and all the horrible things you never wanted to know or in every breath you take can colonize in those little nooks and crannies. Mm -hmm. And so a combination of ozone and, a, and effective microorganisms is just about the only real opportunity you have. Because mm -hmm. if you send a rotary brush through a flexible duct or across that fiber board, you'll get fiberglass fibers, which is horribly bad for mm -hmm. you, or you'll tear up the ducts themselves. Mm -hmm. And you create a, a, a cooling system leak in a 175 degree attic, you've got a new water problem from dew point and then more mold. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So one of the things that impressed me about you and your equipment was that it's like your top end equipment which can do like shopping malls and stuff was less expensive than one treatment from other uh, s other companies that I've used for, for mold and mildew remediation. When that right there told me that you've got integrity because um, you know here in Florida especially where mold is a way of life. Wow. Uh, you know it's like I, and, you know when people and when we hire contractors sometimes to come and do st stuff at our house you know relative to we're in the second poorest county in Florida so relative to other homes in the area our home is a little nicer than others so people think oh these people got money and they come and stick it to us or they try to. Sure. And so I've gotten really good at identifying that and you know finding you know lower cost alternatives and so that's one thing that really impressed me with what you're doing is that you know you were telling me that like the the most expensive um, distributors or, or technicians that are doing using your equipment are charging like a third of what most other companies are charging for the most expensive like New York City prices yeah are like a third of what I paid to have my home made and so you know, that speaks volumes right there. Yeah, and I didn't know about ozone at the beginning with mold remediation. I, I, I didn't stumble onto it, but it was another professor I was talking to. And um, so we had, we had really sort of turned the protocols on their heads with re re replacing the toxic biocides with the hydrogen peroxide-based disinfectants and replacing the, the toxic phthalates for killing the roots with with uh, finely ground borax um, to penetrate into the boards. So in mold remediation, if you're not familiar with it, folks, you do a lot of demolition. You remove a lot of porous building materials, but the studs that are left behind and the framing members and the decking boards that hold up the floors of the house are often uh, penetrated by the root structures. And in mold remediation, it's the root structures that are the basis of the organism. Well, ozone cannot get at the roots, and that's why you know, there's a lot of conflict in the ozone world. A lot of ozone manufacturers will tell their customers that ozone is a, a panacea, that it's this magic bullet and it will absolutely vaporize mold and turn it to ash, and, and that's it. And the process of oxidization is similar to the process of burning in an open flame. What they don't tell you is that ozone isn't Casper the Friendly Ghost. <laughs> and that if you've got ozone growing on a board, or mold growing on a board, the root structures are going 3 16 to 3 8 of an inch, and the ozone's gonna get stuck on the surface, mm. and, because it's a gas. And so, um, you know, ozone is an effective component of mold remediation, and not a substitute for it. So, if you're suffering from mold, and you're really sick, you know, I highly encourage you, if you can't find an all-natural mold removal professional in your area to check out our all-natural mold removal system. And a component of that is an ozone generator. Mm -hmm. And the way I found out about ozone, I was talking over the phone to Dr. Rip Rice, and he founded the International Ozone Association. He's still alive to my knowledge. He's in his 90s now. When I met him, he was in his early 80s. And I had been telling him about my advances to sort of remove the toxicity from the remediation protocols. And he said, well, Charlie, if you're not using ozone at the end of your treatment, you're leaving behind a contaminated structure. And I was aghast, you know, of course, I, I'm, I've got some of the most advanced protocols around, Dr. Rice, what do you mean? He said, well, you need to check out a study that was just published on our website and in our journal. So not only did he found the International Ozone Association, he founded the only journal or scholarly journal dedicated to 
white papers related to ozone gas. And there was a study that was done uh, after the anthrax attacks on the post office. You remember yeah. that? And so, uh, you know, I may have my own suspicions what caused those things, but, <laughs> you know, the fact remains that anthrax was sent in letters to the post office and uh, they had to shut it all down. And so the Army hired scientists at Los Alamos to figure out, you know, how in the heck do you decontaminate a civilian building that's been contaminated with a spore-based pathogen? Mm -hmm. And, you know, that really hadn't been studied before that. And, you know, all the mold remediation protocols that have, that have been written and what the national protocols are all based on asbestos. Mm -hmm. You know, and the theory is that asbestos, when it gets disturbed, it goes airborne. And as it goes airborne, it can get into your lungs and go deep and cause the, the terrible conditions that you know, asbestos is known to cause. Well, in mold remediation, they did sort of the same thing. They copied the asbestos protocols broadcloth. Well, the problem with that is that they failed to um, pay attention to the component that mold is alive right? and that your body is a potential food source. Mm -hmm. And so the, you know, the spores, yes, they do go airborne, they can go deep into your lungs, but they can also set up shop in your body, in your bloodstream and feed on you. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, the scientists at Los Alamos recognize this and they said, you know, it would be great if there's this magic push button we talked about panacea you could use, but unfortunately, every structure has the, what they call nooks, crannies, crevices, and cul-de-sacs. I, I like to call it the Thomason's English Muffin Study. <laughs> but basically they said there's three-dimensional interfaces in every house and every civilian building where liquid-based uh, disinfectants can't penetrate. Where viruses, bacteria, nanobacteria and mold spores will, will permeate and hide. Mm. And so you, you can do all of these other things, gross removal and HEPA vacuuming and fogging and wet wiping and all of these things that have become the, the tools of the trade in the mold business. But at the end of that uh, decontamination effort, if you don't fill that space with toxic levels of a reactive gas that can permeate those hidden spaces, Mm -hmm. you're never going to completely remediate the structure. Mm -hmm. And so <clears throat> this is, uh, when he turned me on to that study, I, I you know, bought his journal and I read the study and I said, holy crud, I have been failing all of my customers. So uh, that led my search for finding a good ozone generator. And I knew about ozone at that point in my life, but I had never heard of it being employed in mold remediation. The year was 2002. And the first ozone machine I ever bought was a big oh, contraption that was like this. It was a bent piece of sheet metal and it was made in someone's shop and it was $2,500 and, and it was okay. It made some good ozone and I, I started using it on the job. It was such a flimsy case. It started to bend and, and fall apart and I ended up giving it back to the manufacturer. Hmm. I bought it actually from the mold laboratory that used to read my lab reports, the, uh, her husband built these ozone machines in his, his shop here in Florida. Hmm. And, uh, but it just was a big, clumsy, unwieldy, super expensive, non-functional, non-tool. Mm -hmm. and, and then I went through this uh, process over the next uh, you know, many years where we would buy different ozone generators from different manufacturers. You know, the ones that worked the, the best cost the most. You know, absolutely, besides my own machines, the best ozone machines I've ever used to this day are air zone ozone machines. They're made in Taiwan. They're not American made, but they're extremely expensive. You know, a 28,000 milligram per hour workhorse machine, like a lot of my contractors would rely on, it still retails today for $3,000. And uh, <clears throat> that's not even the worst part. The worst part is that when they break, and ozone is just notorious, you know, it's the second most reactive molecule on Earth. Yeah. So it takes a toll on the machines that produce it. There's just no way to get around it. And so my machines would break within six months, and then I'd have to send it back to them to get fixed. They'd stick it on a boat back to Taiwan, and it would be three to four months till I get it back. And then I'd get a bill of five to nine hundred dollars to repair the thing. Jeez. And finally, I just got fed up with it. One day, I, had a, I looked up at my ozone repair shelf, and I had a dozen broken ozone machines from about 10 different manufacturers. 
And I said, there's just got to be a better way. <laughs> so I brought them all home and I locked myself in my garage and I literally took apart all these ozone machines on my workbenches and um, I just kept seeing the same stupid ideas repeated over and over again. It was like someone in 1925 said an ozone machine is a bent piece of sheet metal with a fan at one end and transformers in the middle and then some kind of electrified uh, media at the other end with a grate. And so the ozone, you know, the fan blows through and cools the transformers and knocks the ozone out of the box. Well, you know, the, the problem was that most of the ozone machines that are in the range that, that regular folks can afford, you know, the sort of under $500 price point, they would use these tiny little computer fans, barely moved any air, maybe 80, 100 CFMs if they're lucky. And they made really low amounts of ozone. Right, and by the way, that's something that one of the objections when I tell people about shock treatment ozone, they go, oh, well, I've already got like an alpine ozonator that I, you know they let run in their house while they're in it, which number one is a really bad idea because you're, in, you're breathing in free radicals because ozone's a free radical. But also, it's like a, you know, a tiny, tiny fraction of what you need to do the job in a building. So they're like, oh, I've already got an ozonator, or I'll borrow my friend's ozonator. And it's like, it ain't the same thing, folks. Well, and that's a really good point. You know, when I'm talking about ozone treatments, I mean shock treatments. So in order to use ozone in an effective way to do work, you've got to super saturate the space following the principles of Boyle's Law to fill that space with toxic levels of this reactive gas. That's what they wrote about in the Los Alamos study. Mm -hmm. And you know the issue is you've got to have massive amounts of ozone to do it. And the other thing is ozone is heavier than air. Right. So you've got to have a lot of air movement to physically fill that space. You know, One of the, f the things that surprised me when I built my first test chamber eight years ago is when you put the ozone machine at six feet in the air versus three feet in the air, sort of, you know, refrigerator height versus countertop height, the refrigerator height, six feet, will fill that space in half the time hmm. as the, you know, the countertop height. Hmm. And that led me to eventually develop my ver vertical ozone tornado models, mm -hmm. which suck the gas off the floor and shoot it up to the ceiling, and it works real well in high ceilinged great rooms and small commercial buildings and things. But you know, you really need a lot of ozone gas to do work because you've got to take it to levels that are high enough to kill the pathogens. Mm -hmm. And the problem with ozone gas, everyone talks about ozone being dangerous. It's extremely dangerous. It's very dangerous for your lungs. Right. You bypass the lungs in other parts of the world and in some states where they have alternative health care acts in the United States, they'll inject ozone directly into the bloodstream, into joints and all sorts of things. It's the oxidative effects on the lung interface that give ozone its bad rap. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, absolutely you should never, ever, ever, folks, be in a house that has high levels of ozone gas. Mm -hmm. The machines that I make, except for my water machine, are all for unoccupied space disinfection. Mm -hmm. Means no people, no plants, and no pets. So the, the concept behind a shock therapy is to literally fill the entire house and the air duct system. You always want to turn your furnace fan or blower to the on position so that that gas circulates through all of the space. The crawl space, the basement, the attic, you know, the entire house. And you want to let that get to levels that are unsafe for viruses, bacteria, mold spores, nanobacteria, prions, and your lungs. Mm -hmm. So that means you can't be there. You know, ozone is not something to toy with. It is a tool. Mm -hmm. And I essentially my claim to fame or what I've been have been called my claim to fame is that I took ozone machines from the the world of like a tiny little appliance that you set on a a countertop to do work and I turned them into real world rugged aggressive tools and I have developed ozone generators that force ozone through a hose and a wand into so you can inject it into carpeting to sterilize your carpeting uh, I have a, a patent on a device for 
putting a structure under positive pressure uh, with ozone gas. Uh, you know what positive pressure is, right? Ken? I do. I do. Yeah. Maybe explain you it, though. Explore. You explain it. Okay. Well, positive pressure <laughs> means that you're essentially moving more air out of the structure than is this, than is coming into it, and so it's forcing the gas out of the building envelope through any voids, crevices, or cracks uh, that exist inside the building envelope, and that allows you to actually completely decontaminate a facility. Uh, you know, prior to my patent, nothing like that existed in the world. And um, it's perfect for really, you know, anyone that's trying to fight bioterrorist agents, you know, if, if there's an Ebola outbreak or something like that, positive pressure is really and truly the only way to just completely um, sanitize a structure because... It, that brings up a good point. Um, because when we're talking about ozonating a building, normally, you're talking about putting ozone generators inside of a building, closing up the doors and windows, letting the generators run for a period of time. Depending on the size of the building, it sure. could be six, eight hours, it could be 24 hours mm -hmm. or so. Fill the building with ozone, it kills all the mold and mildew. Then you shut them down, open the building up and air it out. With the positive pressure, if my understanding is correct, you put the ozone generators outside the building with an interface to the building where it's blowing the ozone in under pressure and pressurizing the house with the ozone. Is Absolutely, mm -hmm. and you can do it either way. It really depends on what the goal is. And if you're really, you know, if you're trying to kill things, uh, you know, there may be some of your, 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 you know, people in your viewing world that are suffering from things like mites. I know you, we've talked about um, bed bugs, you know, like chemtrails and things like that. And with them come a lot of real nasties and. And so, you know, if you're trying to kill a mite infestation, you might want to seal the entire house up and make real high levels of things called nitric oxides. Now, a lot of people give ozone a bad rap if your machines are capable of converting the nitrogen with the oxygen into a, a much more toxic gas than ozone um, that are nitric oxides, which can turn into nitric acids. But if you're trying to kill mites, you, you want that. You know? mm -hmm. If you're trying to kill bed bugs or pests or scorpions or roaches, you want that. Mm -hmm. If you're trying to deodorize a house and make it nice and pleasant and fresh and clean, then leaving the machine outside the area to be treated and always converting fresh air into ozone makes a much purer form of ozone. Now, does the, does the machine last longer if it's put outside? The oh, machine? absolutely, because you're not circulating that really reactive ion through the entire machine. Mm -hmm. That's what I said, even, you know, even my machines need to be serviced. They're not, they're not impervious. I mean, I make some of the toughest ozone machines in the world. And mm -hmm. one of my first claims to fame is we would, you know, break concrete blocks on top of our ozone machines with a sledgehammer and drop them off of buildings and, and all sorts of strength and durability tests. But um, ozone really, you know, can be used in a, and harnessed in an effective way if you have the right tool. So let's talk about all of the things that ozone will do because I know, for example, of course, it kills mold and mildew. It does. It kills bed bugs and mites. I know from my experience using it in my house, you'll find dead roaches and bugs laying around. Yep. Um, so what all, what all kinds of applications will it do? Oh, odor removal. My God, that's another one. My house, the people lived in our house for 10 years before we moved in, smoked. And like I say, we figured, oh, well, we'll rip out all the carpets, we'll rip out the air conditioners. So we did, we replaced everything. We, we pulled out all the carpets and replaced them, replaced the air conditioning, the ducts, repainted everything. We figured that'll get rid of the smell. Oh no. We'd wake up in the morning and the house would smell like cigarettes. And it wasn't until we got the house ozonated and that Bam! Took care of the cigarette smell. Yeah. So well, ozone doesn't cover up odor-causing contaminants. That's that's the reason why ozone is absolutely bar none the world's best odor uh, remover, because it literally oxidizes and breaks things down mm -hmm. at the source. And the process of ozon ozonation is exactly the same process as burning in an open flame. Mm -hmm. It's oxidization, and so within 26 reactions or less. Ozone will convert even toxic chemicals like formaldehyde into carbon dioxide and water. Mm -hmm. And if you stick a log into a flame, what's left is carbon in the, in the ash, and up in the sky goes carbon dioxide and water. We call it smoke. Mm -hmm. But it's the same 
identical process. So when you've got a cigarette smoke problem, you know, those tars accumulated in layers. And there are a lot of technologies that are like a perfume technology to, to kind of cover up the odors with a perfume. But you know, the sun starts shining through the window, it starts to react with the tars and the things, and, and sooner or later, those odors come back. Mm -hmm. And they come back because they've never actually been dealt with. Well, ozone will break it down layer by layer. And, and will it, can you immediately, instantly eradicate a cigarette problem with, by turning an ozone machine on and coming back 10 minutes later? Absolutely not. It's got to oxidize away in layers just as it build up in layers mm -hmm. over time from the smokers. But when it's gone, it is gone. Mm -hmm. It's kaput. Exactly. It'll never come back again exactly. because it's now carbon dioxide and water. Exactly. And you know, one caveat I have seen, and you can comment on this, but the first time I got my house ozonated, they, it was an inexperienced company, and they did it, I think, too strongly. And I noticed that any rubber that we had in the house dry rotted. So like all the elastic in my clothing, shot. Sure. Uh, rubber power tools. Uh, mm -hmm. Their cords, when I mean, the rubber cords on power tools would dry, rot, and crumble, mm -hmm. and fall apart. So normally you have to take rubber out of the house, right? Can Real. I ask you a question? Mm -hmm. How many hours did they run the machine? 24 hours. So this is something I've been preaching about for years. It's a great, great point. So what I discovered many years ago is that to effectively eradicate odors and biologicals, the, the things that 99% of the people watching this would want to buy an ozone machine to deal with, what you really need is intensely high levels of ozone for very short periods of time. As a matter of fact, you can go to my website, ozonegenerator20,000.com, and click on the Science and Info tab, and that brings down a drop-down page of white papers. You know, some people like to read the newspaper. I like to read white papers or scholarly articles, mm -hmm. and there's a study on there from Penn State. So at Penn State, researchers basically build a box and then they put an ozone uh, hose into the side of the box, they put an outlet port on the top so the ozone could pass through the box, and then inside they would set petri dishes with different types of bacteria and fungus and mold and mildew. And what they found is once they hit the right concentration levels in that box, at all the time intervals they tested from 10 seconds to 10 hours, they got the same 999.9 mm. kill logs. And so the process of ozonation is effectively done by achieving the right parts per million. Mm. But the problem is you can't rate a machine in parts per million. It's a volumetric dependent measurement. So you can go on Amazon and you can buy a $100 little cheap ozonator that maybe makes 500 milligrams an hour. And you can take that machine and stick it in a shoebox, and in an, several hours time, you'll have really high parts per million, enough to do work, and kill things. Just like you can take a match and light it, it's about 400 degrees, and if you stick it in, on a candle and light the candle and stick it in a shoebox, you've got an effective heater for your shoebox. But you move it into your kitchen, <laughs> and it doesn't raise the temperature of the room a degree. Mm -hmm. And that's the same thing that happens with these tiny little ozone generators. Mm. So I recommend you never, ever, ever run any of my machines more than eight to 12 hours, and 12 is pushing it. Hmm. And the way I arrived at those time frames is, again, back to this Los Alamos study. So one of the things they tested was ozone degradation. And that what they started to see serious degradation at 16 hours. And uh, it continued on. And at that time, uh, it was 2002, they started to see damage to sensitive tapes and electronic storage media. So this is like VHS and, and you know floppy disks, which we don't don't have anymore. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, so I recommend you cut that time in half, eight hours, because I have a lot of Joe Sixpack customers that don't pay attention. And so I cut that time in half in my owner's manual, never go over eight hours. And I found that there's just about nothing if you use my ratings. And that's another thing, most machine ratings are completely not honest. Mm. You know, there are several machines you can watch me take apart on video on the website. Uh, and I have a lot of haters out there. A lot of people really don't like me because I take apart their ozone machines. But you won't find any customers that are unhappy mm -hmm. because I make my customers happy. But these, some of these machines I've taken apart, I've thrown them in a 14 by 14 foot ozone test chamber and tested them for an hour. 
and in an hour's time, I did not hit the minimum requirement to kill all viruses, all bacteria, and all mold spores, which is six to 10 parts per million. Yet some of these machines were rated by their manufacturers at 4,000 square feet house that they said that they could treat. Now, if you put it in a 4,000 square foot house for 24 or 48 hours, eventually, with enough air movement, you'd get some action done, but you would do all those terrible things that you're talking about. Mm. Breaking down your Lycra dresses and your uh, waistbands and your shorts and the little elastic on your shoes mm -hmm. and you know the stuff that you never wanted to, mm -hmm. to damage. Mm -hmm. And it's all a function of duration, not concentration. Mm. The efficacy of kill is all about concentration, not duration. Mm -hmm. And that's not me, that's the scientists at, at Penn State proved that it makes a, sense a too, long time ago. Because it doesn't take long to asphyxiate something or somebody. You know? Sure. It's like you put somebody in a room full of, of gas, uh, it's not going to take long, as we know from World War II, before they're going to be dead. Sure. So, um, so that makes sense. So do you, when, if somebody's buying one of your machines, do you have like guidelines that come with the machine or on your website? Yeah, I do, sure, so absolutely. So somebody knows like for X number of square feet, yep. which machine to get? Yeah, so you can always buy a bigger machine and run it for a shorter period of time, mm -hmm. but the converse is not true because ozone has only about a 22 to 45 minute half-life depending on temperature, humidity, and a few other uh, factors. Mm -hmm. And so um, if you're using too small of a machine in too big of a space, the lifetime of that molecule is just not long enough to get to the nether reaches of the house and to do the work that you're hoping to accomplish. Mm -hmm. But you can always cheat a bigger machine in a smaller space by cutting the time. Okay. And uh, so we do have those ratings for each and every one of our machines. And we, we make another little machine that uh, I, I like to use for, you know, I, I was telling you before we turned on the camera about when I first found out about mold remediation and I was studying the active ingredient in my chemicals that made some of my customers sick that caused me to start researching safer ways. And what I found out is the active ingredient in my product, it was called IAQ2000, we still sell it today, but the active ingredient is in like 75 to 85% of all commercial fungicides. It's called quaternary ammonia mm -hmm. and it's in Lysol. And I used to spray my body down with Lysol when I was in college doing Ooh. mycology experiments. So I had studied mycology when I was going to uh, Kent State and Akron U, and I used to disinfect my body so I wouldn't Ooh. contaminate my containment Ooh. with this quaternary ammonia stuff, and I found out how toxic it was. Jeez. And so then I started moving on to other things under my kitchen sink, which I found were also full of toxins, and that led me to start looking at ingredients in food. Well, this is 1998, not 2016. So it's widely known now that our food has kind of been adulterated and, and full of toxic chemicals. But, mm -hmm. you know, just because you buy an apple from the store and it says certified organic, I happen to know from some of my customers who own printing companies that occasionally they order organic labels and they slap them onto fruits and vegetables that aren't organic. Yeah. So, you can buy all your fruits and vegetables from the store, put them in your kitchen sink, and use a different kind of ozone generator. Not one that's for air, but one that's for water. Mm -hmm. You drop an air bubbler stone like you use mm -hmm. in an aquarium into your kitchen sink, fill it up with water, throw in your fruits and vegetables and ozonate it, and it will break down any residual pesticides if it's not truly organic. Mm -hmm. Or if you can't afford organic or it's not available in your little slice of America, because there are some rural areas where it's challenging to find true organic food. Um, and it will break down some of those harmful residual pesticides. And you'll see this oily film coming to the top of the water. And I can testify it works because my wife, who's from Taiwan, got one of those machines from Taiwan and we use it and it works. Oh yeah, you can you know, buy your poultry. Most of our poultry, m many people don't know, is actually contaminated um, with uh, various types of microorganisms. Mm -hmm. uh, I was uh, asked to work on the a serious problem they have in the UK uh, several years ago with contaminated poultry. So you can take your chickens and put them in the kitchen sink, fill it up with water, bubble the ozone gas and sterilize the chicken. It increases the shelf life of your fruits and vegetables. Mm -hmm. And you can take that same uh, generator cell, connect it to an oxygen concentrator and make real 
totally pure, almost medical grade ozone and bubble it through olive oil and make uh, ozonated olive oil supplements. And then that same machine you can take to your bathtub and you can fill up or draw a bath, bubble the ozone through it for 20 minutes. Make sure you turn on your, your uh, fan and you know, your exhaust fan in your bathroom so that the air is pure. Mm -hmm. And then you can soak in a tub full of ozonated water and get the benefits of ozone uh, going into your skin. And it's, there have been a lot of studies that show an increase in metabolism and you know, a, a decrease in toxins and different types of skin issues that benefit from, from soaking in an ozone, ozone bathtub. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's a machine that we've been in manufacturing for uh, many years that a lot of our customers love. Now, I also remember you pointed me to an ozone carpet cleaner. Is that something you guys sell? Well, yeah, so one of the, in my first uh, embodiments in new ozone technologies that I've developed, uh, I was asked to develop a system for sanitizing carpeting. And it doesn't actually clean carpets, you know, you need uh, surfactant and water to do that, you know. Water is the, the world's best solvent. And so, um, but when you commercially clean a carpet with a steam carpet cleaner, even the really best truck mounted high efficiency, what they call dry steam uh, carpet cleaners, they only kill about 80% of the bacteria, they only remove about 80% of the dirt, and they only re-extract about 95 to 96% of the water. So that means they're leaving 20% of the dirt, 20% of the microbes, and 3% to 5% water, and that's a recipe for microbial mm -hmm. growth. Mm -hmm. So many carpet cleaners actually will either mix a perfume in with their, their right. detergent, or they will spray a perfume after they're done, or they run ozone generators. I mean, the carpet cleaners of the world have or were early adopters of ozone technology I mean, for many, many years, 30, probably 30, 40 years. And of course, losing little tiny ozone generators, but it's a way of, over that first couple days while the microbes are growing, it keeps the odor uh, down where it's bearable, or they mask it with perfume so you don't know that the carpet's sticking. And then when it dries out, typically, the microbes uh, either go into dormancy or they die. So I invented a machine that actually generates really high volumes of ozone, and it blows it through a hose and a, and a floor wand that you can actually force into carpeting. And even my small homeowner models have a small hose and a wand attachment. You've got to wear a respirator if you're going to use that technology. But you can actually force the ozone gas into upholstery or carpeting or clothing that's been contaminated. I have a lot of hunter customers, which may not be popular. So you could get rid of bed bugs in, in a mattress then with that, could you? Well, or at least on the surface. So bed bugs are a little different subject. When you get into killing insects, it takes 10 to 20 times the gas volume. The only other way to kill them is with really long duration treatments. So bed bugs specifically were studied at Purdue University. And they found that at, they were able to kill them two ways. One with extremely high concentrations. Now I developed a commercially available bed bug system that will do that as a substitute for the heat system. It uses ozone, essential oil, and natural dust as a complete uh, bed bug elimination system. But if you're talking about a homeowner, you know, there's a lot of equipment in that system. It's almost $20,000 worth of equipment. Mm. So it's too much for the average homeowner. So what you can do is buy a high output cannon like the kind that, uh, that you got from me. Mm. And you can stick it in a room and seal off that room. And then you can let it run for a long period of time. Now, in that application, I definitely recommend taking out all your rubber cords and latex and lycra dresses mm -hmm. and the things that you're worried about because you're going to violate my eight-hour rule. Will the, it damage foam in the mattress? Typically not. We, we don't typically see that. Now, if you wrapped it in a bag and used just the ozone on the foam mattress, depending on the nature of the foam, it could. But um, what our cost, what the other way that they were able to kill them in the Purdue study was 18 to 24 hours of lower levels of ozone. Mm. And so what happens is the <coughs> bugs, you know, they breathe. And so the more they breathe, every time they breathe, they get damaged. But they have the uh, capacity to seal off their breathing tube. So it's kind of like holding their breath. They're like, <gasps> mm -hmm. <laughs> and they get some ozone. And then, <gasps> 
and they get some more ozone. And each time they get that ozone in, there's more and more damage that's uh, done to the bug. But there are some really effective essential oil-based products that you can use as an alternative pesticide to toxic pesticides too. Mm -hmm. And in combination, it's a really lethal combination. Even if you don't get an outright kill of bugs, you're usually opening up tiny little holes on the inside of their breathing tubes that make those essential oil products work really, really fast. Mm. Mm. And, uh, you know, I have also helped, oh, somewhere between 500 and 1,000 people start their own businesses, depending on whether you're talking about starting it from scratch or adding it as a sideline to some other business that they do. And that's why I say between 500 and 1,000, because I have a lot of people that were already in business as a carpet cleaner or a janitor or a house cleaner that added my equipment to their uh, already existing business as a, as a new revenue stream. But we've have, had a lot of homeowners that, you know, had a treatment like you did professionally, um, paid a lot of money for it, and decided they'd like to make some money with this. And so uh, I, one of the real problems with the ozone machines in the marketplace when I got into the business is that there really wasn't a high output, effective machine under $1,000. Right. And so I thought there was a real sweet spot in the marketplace for a functional tool that would do real work with ozone that was somewhere underneath that thousand dollar, you know, crushing price point. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I've helped many, many, many people start their own businesses and some of them are making as little as a few hundred dollars a month, uh, which helps with their mortgage to other people that are making, you know, over a hundred thousand dollars a year. And we're actually in the process right now of putting together a national franchise using our equipment that'll be turnkey. And it will allow for all of the different things that can be done. So basically a business in a box. Yeah, but a real franchise. You know, franchises are regulated by the Federal Trade Commission and they need to, a lot of my customers are not uh, looking for turnkey businesses. They just are looking for some extra income and some freedom in their life. Uh, but for those that are really looking for someone to hold their hand and to t show them step by step exactly what to do, the franchise model was developed, you know, because with the franchise, everything is rigidly defined and it's, you know, the books that get filed with the Federal Trade Commission are this thick uh, and it breaks down everything. But in that system, it'll be odor removal business in a box, a sanitizing business in a box for you know daycare centers and health clubs and gyms and, and doctor's offices. There'll be a biohazard cleanup uh, business in a box for uh, certified biohazard cleanup contractors, uh, certified mold remediation, and then the certified green bed bug removal. And that'll, it's a combination system, which is essentially five individual businesses all built around the same core equipment with national certifications for each uh, of the major things in a franchise package so that every single thing is done. But for people that aren't looking for a full-blown franchise, it's an easy way to make extra money. I've got some guys that have bought equipment from me and they've thrown up a website and they rent it out in their hometown and make a little side revenue that way. Yeah, I'll tell you, you know, I got a couple machines and um, I do it for my staff and myself. and. Uh, you know, they love it. They absolutely love it. And they'd be happy to pay for it. Of course, it's one of the benefits of working for me. But um, but it would be very, very easy for me just to tell friends and have all the business I wanted, especially here in Florida, because so many people have a mold and mildew problem and know it. Um, and, uh, you know, a, a lot of people think that they don't, and they do. Well, you know, just last week, my wife and my daughter came down with a head cold and uh, they were complaining their upper respiratory system was giving them heck and I, I drove my wife's van to pick my daughter up from school and I smell, I turned on the air conditioning system and I immediately turned it off. I mean, I could just, I've had mold in my body several times, folks, so I'm a mold victim, I'm not just a mold remediator, mold expert and, you know, when you've had mold in your body, you become attenuated to it and it is, mm -hmm not fun. Mm -hmm. And I could just smell the mold screaming out of the inside of this air, air conditioning system. So what did I do? I immediately came home, went in my garage, pulled out an ozone generator, 
threw it in the vehicle, turned on the, the machine. I ran it for a half hour with the heat on, a half hour with the AC on, because I'm not sure exactly about the inner workings mm -hmm. of the mm -hmm. car. I wanted to make sure there were no parts of the HVAC system that I didn't treat. And, you know, very next day when I, I drove it uh, to make sure it was all gone, crystal clear, fresh, clean air. That brings up a good, yeah, it's a very good point that you can do vehicles because, yeah, especially here in Florida, with all the pollen and all the junk in Ugh. the air, and then it gets into your air conditioning system, and that's exactly it, man. You, especially in the summertime, you turn it on, and the first blast out of there especially is just, it, smell, it reeks of mold and mildew. Oh, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. I mean, air conditioning systems in general, you know, that coil is wet, mm -hmm. and there's a temperature differential. Mm -hmm. And when you get a hot air mass meeting a cold surface, or a cold air mass meeting a warm surface, you get dew point. Dew point creates moisture, and moisture creates perfect environment for mold. microbial growth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, one other area I wanted you to talk about, this is near and dear to my heart because I've spent like $12,000 building over many years like through a path of discovery and wasting a lot of money mm -hmm. with other people um, building my own water treatment system. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm on a well here in Florida sure. and I have really hard water. It took a lot to get it to where now what I'm doing is using peroxide, uh, hydrogen peroxide along with other kind of conventional filtration and stuff. And it works really well sure. and it's non-toxic. One of the great things about it is, you know, chlorine is a carcinogen, it's very toxic. And even with conventional systems, one of the things that they don't tell you is that even if you've got a carbon filter and things to capture that uh, chlorine to keep it from coming out of your faucet, it doesn't always work, especially when your equipment gets older. And that's, some, that's a little secret that I've found with water purification systems is that, yeah, they may work great when they put them in, but if you're not testing your water every year oh, or yeah. so, you know, and that equipment starts getting old, then all of a sudden you get all kinds of junk in your water that you weren't planning on and getting It's not just the chlorine, it's the chloramines. Exactly. You know, there's all sorts of other toxins. Exactly. That's that it. Out. And so the beauty of peroxide is you don't get any of that. You that's get right. oxygen that's really actually healthy for you. And but, you know, even that is, it's difficult to get peroxide and it's expensive. And so I've been looking at peroxide systems and I had no idea that you, uh, you either have or you know some people that have peroxide oh, sure. water. Yeah, treatment. as a matter of fact, ozonated water systems, you know, the first ozone systems in municipalities were done over a hundred years ago. You know, Nikola Tesla uh, was a huge fan of ozone water treatment systems. He believed that that was the, you know, the the future of all water treatment. And, uh, you know, whole house water systems are something that I personally don't, that do not specialize in at this point. I have a new technology that's uh, gonna be a chemical free swimming pool system. But when it comes to whole house systems, they really need to be custom designed to either right. your well, your holding tank, all of the things that requires a lot of engineering and math. And so there are some competitors of mine that are, are called Ozone Solutions. Mm -hmm. You can find them at ozonesolutions.com. And, and they're really knowledgeable ozone engineers. They're, their main core business is real industrial size ozone systems. They do make ozone shock treatment machines. And in my humble opinion, mine are better. Mm -hmm. But their guys are just wonderful, friendly, knowledgeable staff and they have the capacity to engineer a custom system for your well system or your, you know, uh, city cistern water. system or whatever you might have, even, mm -hmm. even city water. And there's some new technologies that I'm experimenting with that have come out just recently uh, that allow you to make ozone from the water itself. And I have a, new, a few new devices that we're playing with that we will be coming out with soon that allow for that. But at this point in time, if you folks are looking to replace your conventional well treatment cistern system or, or even treat your, your city water, uh, the guys at Ozone Solutions are really top notch and you, won't, you can't uh, you know, find better people. Hmm. So okay. it's a little commercial for them. Okay. Well, and also, I mean, that's one of the things I liked about you and you know, getting to know you is that you're not just trying to pitch your stuff. You've told me about all kinds of solutions and technologies for all kinds of stuff that I need. And so, you know, that honesty and integrity, I'm not seeing that with other, other companies a lot of times. You know, it's like pitch, pitch, pitch my stuff, and they won't even be honest about what it is they're doing. 
and you know, so they make it sound like some proprietary system that's magic that you don't need to know about. Well, you know, and that's the thing. Most, you know, when it comes to mold uh, and ozone, especially, there are just charlatan after charlatan after charlatan. And you know, the reason most mold remediators are terrible at what they do is the companies that do the certification and training of mold remediators, as we mentioned, really do not get to the core of what products to use when. When it comes to ozone, there's a lot of outright fabrication, you know, that mold can be just immediately vaporized by, by ozone gas. And, and the fact of the matter is mold can be dealt with in a systemic way that works 100% of the time every time using very simple scientific approach. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I have taught contractors as far away as Australia and Canada to use my safe mold removal system. And I have helped homeowners all over the world that can't afford to use it, to do it. And as a matter of fact, if I can teach a homeowner to use my system, imagine how much more lethal it becomes in the hand of a contractor. Mm -hmm. You know, I was at the airport in Colorado several months ago and a guy called me up to order some new ozone machines. And he said, you know, Charlie, I just want to thank you. He said, I've using your mold removal system, I've become the number one mold remediator in my part of Ontario. And I used to actually sell a, a whole mold removal business in a box that was not a franchise uh, before I realized the implications of that. And I, I, I apologized to him. I said, you know, I, I got to apologize to you. I never sold a mold removal system to a contractor in Ontario. So I think you're thanking the wrong guy. He said, oh, no, no, no. He said, I bought your $97 do-it-yourself mold removal system, and I applied that system to my mold removal business, and I've become the number one contractor in my part of Ontario. Hmm. And so the fact of the matter is it's simple based on science. Spores, roots, secondary byproducts. And if your system is designed to eradicate those things, it's gonna work. And then, like you said, the effect of microorganisms to gobble up the dead residual PC parts. That's a really vital thing, and it's very not understood by the majority of Americans. Mm -hmm. Most people think of microorganisms as stuff you wanna get rid of mm -hmm. and not get more of. And mm -hmm. you know, people are rubbing this alcohol all over their hands. I see it everywhere oh, yeah. at the airports. and. You know, there's a subject that most, uh, even scientists in America, don't know much about called pleomorphism. Oh, yeah. And pleomorphism is the ability of certain microbes to turn into other kinds of microbes. Mm -hmm. And it has actually been proven and demonstrated that a virus can turn into a bacteria and back into a virus again. Exactly. And in the presence of alcohol, especially ethyl alcohol mm -hmm. that is loaded with all those hand sanitizers loaded with, that pleomorphistic behavior manifests. And it's really, really toxic, nasty stuff. And it kills off the healthy, good bacteria that mm. should be on your skin and in your environment doing beneficial things for the body and the home. Exactly. You know, I teach that a lot about pleomorphism because within the body, depending on the environment in the body, the, that's exactly what, when pleomorphism takes place, it's when you have an acidic, toxic environment in your body, you'll get all of these beneficial microbes that will morph into pathogens. Well, we never touched on this. I didn't know you taught that. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. And so that's, uh, you know, a big subject I've, I've been on for years. Uh, so how does somebody know when to rip out the walls and, you know, do an extensive treatment as opposed to just doing a shock ozone treatment? Well, you know, here's what ozone can do and what it can't do. What ozone can do is it can kill all the viruses, all the bacteria, and all the mold spores on the surfaces of things and in the air. It can break down virtually any odor causing uh, chemical or residual thing that's creating an odor in the house. What it cannot do is it cannot penetrate into hidden spaces and most importantly it will not penetrate a substrate. So you know the sad fact is if there's mold growing on drywall in your house and someone tells you you can turn on an ozone machine and get rid of it, they're a liar, don't trust them, don't listen to them, and run, as, run don't walk. Mm. Because when mold is actually colonizing, and I mean flowering, where you can recognize it as physical mold. See, what we visualize as mold, folks, is really not mold. You know, when you see the green fuzzy stuff on the cheese in your cheese drawer, or the bread in your bread door, it is really the fruit body of the mold. 
it's the reproductive part. It isn't the mold itself. To see the mold itself, you've got to shave off the substrate, put it underneath a microscope, and blow it up to, at magnification to see the root structures. The root structures are the body of the organism. So I tell my customers, you've got to imagine mold in your mind's eye as a dandelion. Everyone knows you can lop the top of a dandelion off on Friday with your lawnmower, <laughs> come back next Friday, and there it is again, if you don't kill that taproot. Well, with mold, it's the same way. So if you've got mold physically flowering on porous building materials like drywall or soft wood paneling, or if you've got mold growing on some kind of pre-digested um, sawdust and glue type object, you know, we have a lot of uh, manufactured building materials today that are essentially not much more than sawdust and glue. Yeah. Those types of things really need to be removed physically to get those root structures out because the ozone will not penetrate them. Mm. If you have any solid structural members that are left behind, those can all be left, be treated, the root structures can be killed, and they can be made safe. But you know, sometimes it is beyond the scope of a regular homeowner, depending on that homeowner, and depending on what is available to them in the form of tools. In my all natural mold removal system, we give you the books and the videos and we give you a basic ozone generator and a fogger. And those are the, the tools that are very hard to rent. In most parts of America, it's difficult to rent an ozone generator and it's difficult to rent a fogger. And there are a whole lot of products that are sold as all natural mold panacea products that are really not very good either. There's a, a product they sell at every Home Depot in America called Concrobia Mold Control. Al, Al Simon invented it. Al, I apologize to you, but this is the truth. He invented the product for bacteria. It was marketed under the name as Cleanol, and it's essentially baking soda's kissing cousin, sodium carbonate. So baking soda is sodium bicarbonate. This is sodium carbonate and essentially a surfactant, like a dish soap. And it, it doesn't work real well for mold. But if you want a homeowner's mold sol killing solution, straight brown bottle, 3% hydrogen peroxide with a long, healthy squirt of dish soap, shaken, not stirred, <laughs> <laughs> and put it into a spray bottle. It's a great all-around disinfectant. Matter of fact, in my own house, we've replaced all of our Lysol and all of our toxic chemical cleaning products with simple brown bottle hydrogen peroxide. Mm -hmm. You need to store it in a solid bottle, folks. So hydrogen peroxide is light reactive. Mm -hmm. uh, but with that extra s uh, dish soap, that relaxes the surface tension of the water. You know, when you buy brown bottle hydrogen peroxide, it's 3%, which means it's 97% water. Mm -hmm. So it's only 3% of the good stuff. And that dish soap will react, relax the surface tension of the water component so that it's wetter and it penetrates. And it'll kill viruses, bacteria, mold spores, mm -hmm. and all that it leaves behind is a little bit of water and some phosphate from the dish soap. I totally vouch for that because I do that. I ha because I've got a peroxide water system, I'll use peroxide with a little Miracle 2 soap. Oh yeah, Miracle 2, one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. We talked about that. Miracle 2 soap, which is great. It, it has a lot of weird properties of its own. It doesn't leave a soap scum, for one thing. Yep and then uh, effect of microorganisms mm -hmm. and good old fashioned vinegar. Oh yeah. Good old fashioned white vinegar is amazing what it will kill and clean. And with those three things, man, it's like I don't need anything else in my house. And sure. people can't believe that these simple inexpensive things will do the job better than all these expensive chemicals from the grocery store. Yeah, and, and never forget grandma's favorite 20 mule team borax. Yeah, right, I have borax too for laundry. Yeah, and 20 mm -hmm. mule team borax is one of the you know, that uh, tetraoctra borohydrate, which is the, what it's made out of, mm -hmm. is the one of nature's best antifungals. It's really, really effective. Mm -hmm. It's the basis of our main root killer uh, that we use to treat structural members with. We're not using the 20 mule team version. We're using a professional uh, version that was invented about 30 years ago to combat termites, wood boring beetles, and carpenter ants. But most people don't realize that termites and wood boring beetles and carpenter ants don't actually digest the wood. They have a symbiotic relationship with a fungus or a mold in their gut called fusarium mold and that generates the enzymes capable of breaking down and digesting the wood for the bugs. Mm -hmm. And so that borax works by interrupting the mold in the gut mm -hmm. and then the bugs starve to death. Mm -hmm. So these real 
safe, simple, common household goods that mm -hmm. grandma would recognize and in fact would be in her cupboards are the things that you should be using and mm -hmm. get rid of all of those toxic other chemicals, mm -hmm. you know, the Lysols and the quaternary ammonias and, mm -hmm. and the phthalates and all of these toxic mm -hmm. chemicals, they're garbage yeah. and they're ineffective. Yeah, that makes me think of something else too. Uh, do you have any experience with using ozone to break down um, off-gassing in new homes? Like, you know, when you build a new home, you got all these paint uh. fumes and carpet fumes. Will ozone treatment knock that back? Absolutely. And what caused me to understand that I was poisoning my customers is I had three ladies that I met early on in my mold career that were multiple chemical sensitivity mm -hmm. victims or sufferers. And, you know, I thought this is what these were some of the ladies I thought were wrong. I started to do the research and found out I was wrong. But, you know, I have a customer here in Florida and his business is removing Chinese drywall. Mm. And so one of the things that Chinese, you, oh, drywall from China. Made yes, China. the Chinese drywall that had the toxic chemical soup mixed in and mm. would break down into acids and off gas and made people so sick. And so of what happened is a lot of these Chinese drywall housewives that were at home breathing these off gases became chemically sensitive. So what he discovered is if he would just stick them in their house after he ripped the drywall all out and redid the whole house and put them in with the carpet and the new paint, they would smell the natural or the, the unnatural VOCs that are coming off of these new building products that you're talking about. Uh, from carpet to latex paint. Mm -hmm. And they would think that he had used new Chinese drywall mm -hmm. because they were really having a reaction to the off-gassing from the VOCs. So what he does is he sets my ozone machine up overnight. Um, the night before he brings them back, he lets it run for eight to 10 hours. He you know shuts off on the timer, the house empties out, and then he brings the homeowners back and it's knocked out 90 to 95% of all that off-gassing. And you can do the same thing in a new car. New cars are full of way more synthetic, so it takes more than one treatment for the average new car. But you can break down a lot of the off gas. And, you know, well, many people don't realize that some of the worst air you'll ever breathe is the first three minutes that oh, you're yeah. in a car yeah, when yeah. the sunlight is reacting. You know, I've always known chemicals. that just intuitively. So I always, when I get in a car, the first thing I do is hold my breath and I roll the windows down. Oh yeah, it's really, really potent. Mm -hmm. You know, the sun uh, does a number on all the synthetic uh, products mm -hmm. that are in the dashboards and mm -hmm. in the synthetic seat covers and things like that. Mm -hmm. And it, it really is toxic air. Yeah, yeah. Matter of fact, in, in Asia, it's very common to use an ozone generator, cup, uh, cup holder ozone generator that fits right in your cup holder, mm. plugs into your cigarette lighter. And so while you're, you know, in the building and the sun shining, that ionization is, is breaking down a lot of those VOCs. But in Asia, they use ozone for everything, where we are just really in the dark ages. Uh, the Asians are far, far advanced in that field. Well, we've got all the chemical companies. <laughs> That's the real reason, of yeah. course. You know, We have yeah. a lot of powerful moneyed interests, and you know, ozone and hydrogen peroxide replace 95% of the chem toxic chemicals that are used uh, for sanitization today. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I, I think I've exhausted all the things that I can think of talk about. Have you got anything you think we haven't covered that we should? Well, you know, I just for people that are looking to have, that have a serious mold problem, you know, we, we can come to your house and treat it for you. So you're not stuck doing this on your own. If that's a bit overwhelming for you, and you know, we do know some other all natural mold remediators. There aren't many, but we can refer you to someone in your area if, if we don't serve there. Uh, but, you know, honestly, just, Keep listening to Ken uh, <laughs> because you know he's full of uh, enlightenment, and I've really enjoyed my short friendship that I've had with him because the guests that he has on and the topics that he covers are really, really germane to living in this post-modern <laughs> world that we have today. A <laughs> super toxic, insane world we're living in. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's sure. it. All right, well, thank you so much, Charles. I really appreciate it. This has been extremely enlightening and just. Uh, just fantastic in every way. I just really enjoy this, and I think it's been very helpful for folks. I um, thank you for having it's me. Obvious, Ken. you know what you're talking about, the level and depth of knowledge that you've got. So I really appreciate it. So until next time, 
We'll catch you on freshandalive.com uh, and freshandaliveblog.com. So thanks for watching.